My name is Livy Paul, and I am the co-president of PTO Council. And the PTO Council is made up of parents from across the 10 schools in the uh, in District 97, across the elementary and middle schools. Um, and the PTO Council is one of the sponsors of tonight's event, along with um, other folks who I need to do some thankings for. Um, in addition to the PTO Council, we have the Oak Park District 97, obviously, is hosting um, with us here in, at Irving, and the Oak Park Teachers Association, as well as Common Core Illinois and Advance Illinois. Um, they are two nonprofits dedicated to advancing education in Illinois. We also thank our gracious hosts, uh, Irving and uh, Principal Hodge, and all the parent volunteers who are helping make the evening more seamless. Um, so as you know, tonight the topic is Common Core tonight, um, Common Core State Standards, which have been adopted by 45 states uh, for language arts and math. Uh, the New York Times editorial board recently called Common Core the most important educational reform in this country's history, uh, ahead of NCLB, for example. <laughs> The ultimate goal of these research-based standards is success for every one of our children, not success on test-taking, but success in life as adults. Today in Illinois, only one in four high school students graduate ready for real life. 75% of the kids in Illinois are not ready for college or career when they leave high school. And that is why Illinois adopted these new standards. I believe personally, and the reason I'm here to help champion this, is that I believe our public education can and should deliver college and career readiness for every child. I want my two daughters, my 10-year-old and my 13-year-old, to learn the skills of critical thinking and the ability to ground their arguments and evidence, unless, of course, they're asking for a smartphone. <laughs> <laughs> and if they're not on track to do that, I want to know now. I don't want to find out when they enter high school. I don't want to find out when they're struggling as freshmen in college. I don't want to find out when they're having a difficult time getting a job. So as I've learned more about Common Core standards over the past year, I've become convinced that they will help my children be more successful in life. I've also realized that this transition is significant, and it won't always be easy or smooth. So I need to be informed. I need to work with my kids' teachers. And most importantly, I need to help my children, my two girls, rise to the challenge of the higher expectations. And that is why I'm so pleased to introduce tonight Sandra Alberti. She will help inform us all about what Common Core Standards mean for our schools and for us as parents and teachers. <clears throat> to give a little background on who Sandra is, she's the Director of State and District Partnerships and Professional Development for Student Achievement Partners, which is a nonprofit organization that assembles educators and researchers to design actions based on evidence that substantially improve student achievement. Sandra joined Student, Achieve student Achievement Partners from the New, the New Jersey Department of Education, where she served as the Director of Academic Standards and as the Director of Math and Science Education. In these roles, Sandra was directly involved in state standards, assessment, and professional development policy and implementation strategies. Prior to working at the state level, Sandra held several district level positions, including school superintendent, assistant superintendent of teaching and learning, principal, subject area supervisor, and high school science teacher. She holds a bachelor's, bachelor's degree in biology from Rutgers University and a master's in doctoral, a doctorate degree in education leadership from Rowan University. In addition to this amazing experience she has, she is also, like many of us in this audience, a parent concerned about the success of her own children. Please join me in warmly welcoming Sandra Alberti. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. And uh, it is absolutely a pleasure to be here. And uh, wanted to thank everyone also who has organized this event. Um, I do this a lot. <laughs> this is kind of like my full-time job to talk about the standards, but very rarely uh, do I get to do that from an elementary school auditorium filled with a group of parents and teachers. And so I really appreciate um, the opportunity to share this information with you and your time here uh, as well. So um, I typically run short on time, so I'm going to just jump right into this. Um, as uh, the introduction uh, stated, I work for a nonprofit. We sell nothing. I have nothing to sell you. I don't take honoraria for speaking. It keeps us really busy. Um, but the idea is that we just want this message to get out 
as widely as possible. And so this idea that our organization is committed to uh, actions that scale uh, and impact student achievement is really how we got involved in this work to begin with. Uh, the founders of Student Achievement Partners, the organization uh, that I work for, were the lead architects of the standards themselves and uh, continue to work really hard at uh, thinking about what are all the things that need to happen. And so what I hope to be able to share with you uh, today is a bit more clarity about what the standards are. All too often, I think we just think like, okay, life's gonna get hard for kids and for teachers, but that actually isn't very helpful information. And so we'll talk about some more specificity about what the standards are and what impacts uh, they will have. So uh, to start off with, uh, one great example of when so many people are working on a common is initiative is that there are really great partners out there doing this work. Uh, the Council of the Great City Schools is one of them uh, who have created this video. Like it or not, life is full of measuring sticks. How smart we are, how fast we are, how well we can, you know, compete. But up until now, it's been pretty hard to tell how well kids are competing in school and how well they're going to do when they get out of school. We like to think that our education system does that, but when it comes to learning what they really need to be successful after graduation, is a girl in your neighborhood being taught as much as her friend over in the next one? Is a graduating senior in, say, St. Louis as prepared to get a job as the graduate in Shanghai? Well, it turns out the answer to both of these questions is no. Because for years, states have been setting different standards for what students should know and be able to do at each grade level. That's making it too hard to know if our kids are really doing well enough overall, and if they can really compete for a job someday. What we really need are clear goals. That's where the Common Core state standards come in. They're like a total sea change in education. Consistent, strong, clear benchmarks for English language arts and math. Here's how it works. You can think of kindergarten through 12th grade like a giant staircase. Each step is a skill your child needs to learn before stepping up to the next one. But right now, too many kids aren't really confident with like two plus two before they have to move on to two times two. We need more focus on the skills that help them move up the stairs or they can slip up and fall behind. And there's another problem. What if everyone's stairs were made at different heights? Well, here we go again, they are. So. A boy in Seattle who's rocking an A in English literature could be getting a C on his Chicago friend's staircase. Oops. We need to create consistent steps in education, too. So first, each standard creates a landing on the staircase, a stop along the way as your child heads toward high school graduation. Each stop is a chance for every parent and teacher to focus on the skills their students are supposed to know at that step, no matter the zip code, language, or race. And more importantly, each standard makes sure all students are learning what they need to know to get to graduation and beyond. Because something like counting to 100 leads to understanding dollars and cents, which eventually leads to understanding how to manage a budget. Secondly, the standards are consistent from school to school, and they match up against international standards too. Now we know how we're doing compared to just about everyone. So even though local communities will still design their own curriculum, with the same rules, Everybody can compete on the same kind of staircase, but standards aren't learning. That's why we need teachers, parents, and students to help make that happen by working together to help kids meet these standards. The world's getting more and more competitive every day, but now when our kids get to the top of their staircase, they can have way more options on where their life goes from there. Clear goals, confident, well-prepared students. That's the Common Core State Standard. That's just kind of a parent-facing message intended to kind of communicate a, a few things and hopefully clear up some misconceptions. Um, so one of the things that, that I will just highlight in that video is even though stairs might kind of communicate everybody doing the same thing at the same time, that is not the message of the standards. And so in fact, the idea about how students in Oak Park, even within a school in Oak Park, are meeting those same targets is very different how, than how students might meet those same outcome expectations uh, in another community. So when we talk about the things that are changing in the standards, we have this language uh, that we use around the shifts. 
And if you will, it's kind of like understanding the forest for the trees. If I describe to you each and every individual expectation at each and every individual grade, it probably wouldn't communicate much to you or to anybody for that matter. So we kind of talk about these broad changes that are happening as a result of the standards and hopefully that will help give you a flavor of what these differences are and most importantly why they are different. Uh, because as we uh, talked about in the introduction here this evening, this is so much more of an initiative than just taking the old Illinois state standards and replacing them with a shared set of expectations across 45 states. These are a set of standards that are grounded in evidence, both what colleges, careers, technical programs, trade programs tell us kids need to know and understand in order to be successful. They are internationally benchmarked against other high performing countries and what their students are experiencing. And so starting with that, we can get to a place where we're really talking about what our systems would look like if we don't just think about, you know, 25% of kids graduating college and career ready, but how could we actually create a system that allowed all kids to, to meet those benchmarks? So talking about these three shifts, uh, I think what's most important is to talk about them from this idea of change. What was and what we anticipate will happen. So the first of these three shifts in literacy talks about the fact that students should be able to build knowledge from content-rich nonfiction. We know across the country, part of the result of No Child Left Behind is we spend more and more time, particularly in elementary schools, around literacy. In my own kids' school, I have a fourth and second grader this year, it is the most sacred block of time probably in the world. I don't even think the kids are allowed to use the restroom during the literacy block. It is like that sacred. But what we know is happening in that literacy block is primarily students are reading stories. They're reading fiction. And as a former principal, as the daughter of a third grade teacher, I am reminded all too often how little time we have left in our elementary schools to learn about science, to learn about social studies, as we expand time in reading stories. So what this first uh, shift is asking us to do is not only to read more nonfiction than we used to read before, but actually using that as a source of knowledge so that I can learn about pretty much any period of time in history. I can learn about any region of the world, not because I have gone there, I've traveled the world, my parents have traveled the world, but because I can read a piece of text that can communicate to me. So in this first uh, shift here, we talk about the importance of reading nonfiction. And it turns out that the skills of reading nonfiction are a bit different than the skills and the challenges of reading fiction itself. So we want students to learn about the world through the text as well as their experiences. And so what this will look like in practice, what this will look like in schools, according to the standards, about half of what students are reading in elementary school will continue to be fiction. So we're not taking that away. It's one of those exaggerated points that's often made in the blogosphere. We still want kids reading stories. That's still really important. But half of what they read should be nonfiction. It could be read-alouds, it could be things that are happening, but not just experiences with nonfiction. So a great example that I often uh, talk to school leaders about, this means more than just kids reading Weekly Reader once a week as their source of nonfiction text. The idea is that students are reading a series of text about a particular topic, and as they learn more about that topic in science and social studies and the arts, what have you, their reading skills improve, their vocabulary becomes more developed in reading that you know, more advanced topic, and they learn more about the world around them. The interesting change happens here in middle school and high school, where these aren't just a set of expectations for English language arts classes, but again, these are based on what kids need in order to be ready for college and careers. So what that actually means is that we need kids who are literate, that aren't just reading in an English class, but they know how to read in a science class. They know how to dig for information when reading primary sources in a social studies or history class. So when you see these um, proportions kind of bumping up a notch in middle school and in high school, it's because we want kids reading in science and social studies classes as well. So that's a bit of a change from where we pretend that kids can learn everything through hands-on experiences. As a former science teacher, I can tell you that you actually have to learn quite a bit in science 
through reading. And I don't necessarily want my colleagues in the English department to be teaching kids how to do that. I'm sure some of you kind of have the professional experience that says, in most of our jobs, we spend a good period of, of time reading and reading for information. And so that's what these shifts are intended to communicate, that kids actually need practice at doing this. So, so this difference between um, the second shift here, uh, where, we, where we talk about what kids do in response to text. To me, this is kind of the most amusing uh, of the shifts to talk about. Because it turns out, believe it or not, that when kids are reading in classes, pretty much our evidence shows us across the country, they read a piece of text, they're asked to answer a question that the maybe amusing thing, if it wasn't so true, is that it doesn't actually require that they've read the text. So an example that you hear, see here is quite typical. Bud, a character in, in a text, felt lonely after his friend ran away. When was a time that you felt lonely? So this is a very typical strategy that doesn't necessarily prepare kids for life after high school, because I don't know how many of you are asked to do something at work in the college <laughs> setting or anything else where people just ask you, so what do you think about it? What's your gut? What's your childhood memories tell you that could make you, you know, give us an answer here? But it's always, what evidence do you have? How can you back it up? So this is kind of a typical question pre-Common Core. And then now when we're talking about what we're looking for is very different. We want people to actually be using evidence to back up their opinions. So actually revising the question from, you know, what's a time that made you feel lonely to what did Bud do and say in the text to show that he was lonely. So this is an example of a real skill that kids will build over time. When we used to do reading tests and the comprehension questions that followed them, it was typical that we would say, okay, read the story. And I remember this from my own education. I'm sure many of you do as well. Close the book. And now I want you to answer these questions about the story. That also is not really a college and career ready skill. The college and career ready skill is this idea that students are to read like an, like an investigator, read like a detective, and write like a reporter. If you want to make, take a position, make a claim, go ahead and make it but use the text to back this up. And so that is the skill that college professors are telling us all over the place kids are not coming to them with. And not because they can't, it's just because they don't have the experience. The primary form of writing in our high schools, and pretty much K-12 we can say, is this idea of just narrative writing. Because it's more interesting to read as a teacher, it's more interesting to write as a student, but it is not the college and career ready skill uh, that we want for kids. So some examples of how obvious these changes should be. More of a upper elementary school, lower middle school, Casey at the bat, very commonly read, very common question. In Casey at the bat, Casey strikes out. Describe a time when you failed at something. Versus the question of what makes Casey's experiences at the bat humorous. Very common uh, students read letter from a Birmingham jail. By the way, a challenging piece of text to read. But a very common prompt that we give kids to respond to after going through that hard work of reading and understanding that text is discuss in writing a time when you wanted to fight against something that you felt was unfair. For those of us who remember reading that in high school, we probably answered that question. It was interesting for the teachers, interesting for the students, but turns out, we probably could all write that essay right now, whether or not we remember that piece of text, whether or not we've written that piece of text. So it doesn't in fact reward students for that hard work of understanding the text. Versus the question, what can you infer from King's letter about the letter that he received? He was responding to a letter. What can you infer based on what he said in his letter about the letter he received? The other interesting thing about this shift, when people hear this idea of reading like a reporter, uh, reading like a detective, writing like a reporter, they think of these as low level questions. These are actually quite high level questions. They require a deep amount of thinking that we just don't give our students the opportunity typically uh, to do. The third of the three shifts in literacy um, is an interesting challenge. It's a challenge because it really changes the way we've typically thought about our practice. When these standards were built, again, grounded in evidence, one of the things that we realized is that what students were reading 
let's say by the end of 12th grade when they graduated, was significantly less complex than what they were required to read, whether they entered a trade program, an apprenticeship, a technical school, a two-year college, a four-year college. And I can remember in my college experience how little access I had to the teacher, the professor, and was very dependent on making sense of that text. And so that typically what we found is that the gap was as much as four years from what kids were reading in high school to what they were required to read after high school, no matter which of these options they selected. And so when kids choose their own reading, what research tells us, all the way through high school, it typically tops out at about a fifth grade level. So when students are just looking for the things that interest them, it pretty much tops out at a fifth grade level. And the way that you get kids better able to read things that have more sophisticated vocabulary, more sophisticated sentence structure and all of that, is they actually need practice doing that. And so what this shift is saying is that we should spend more time with kids doing that, that very thing. We want kids to read things that are more complex than they've ever read before, and this requires a great attention to vocabulary, a great attention to reading, and this becomes the job of teachers to help lead them through this process. And so just to give you the contrasting example of this, typically, kids come into an early elementary program all different levels of readers. So we're not making that go away. But what we say is that what makes you a struggling reader typically is shallow vocabulary and an inability to kind of deal with complex sentence structures. So if you can imagine that our typical response to that has been, well then just give those kids things to read that don't have complex vocabulary and don't have complex sentence structure. And somehow we think that they will catch up to the on grade level expectations is not happening. I mean, it's just not. Kids are reading, they're, you know, reading, busy, busily reading things at their level, but they're not making progress toward grade level expectations. And if we think, at least in this vein, about this staircase of what kids should be reading so that by the time they graduate high school, they are in fact reading things that will prepare them then we have a better shot at doing this. So the idea that this shift is demanding is that more of our instructional time should be spent with kids practicing reading on grade level. Independently, they can still read you know, the things of high interest that engage them, so we still get them into that. But when it comes to the precious instructional time, we really want them practicing with this. So the, as this slide says, the best way to get better at complex text is to read complex text. And so that is going to take a lot of support. You'll probably see your own students come home with things that are a bit harder than they had seen read before. Uh, not necessarily a bit longer. Because it turns out if you really want kids practicing, we're gonna have to go after shorter texts that kids could read, reread. You could spend a week in class doing a shorter piece of text over and over again. But the idea is that they're getting stronger and stronger. It's like they're exercising, building muscles for what it looks like to read something challenging. What are these words? How can I figure out what the meaning of these words are? It is typical of what we have to do all of the time in the real world. And so this is a strategy that kids need to learn, um, and that's part of these standards. Now in math, it's a bit different. We also have three standards in math. And if we could kind of describe the state of affairs in math education in this country, it is often described as a curriculum that is a mile wide and an inch deep. Uh, a, a associate of ours who is still teaching fourth grade uh, calls it the spray and pray approach to teaching math. We just give kids everything there is and hope some of it, some of it will, will eventually stick. And so when I think about equivalence between mathematics and literacy, which I usually hesitate to make those connections, if, if our strategy with struggling readers has been then just give them something easier to read, our strategy with kids who struggle with math is we just tell them to hold on till Monday because we're starting something new on Monday. You know, you don't understand how to add and subtract, don't worry, we're gonna teach money on Monday. Don't worry, we're gonna do this the next day. And we don't really take time within the math world to help kids build kind of the thing I really do pray for for our kids, confidence in math. It is true that there has been a significant amount of research in math curriculum and math education, and just an interesting thing to note, that it is only in this country that we believe that kids are born 
good at math or not. I mean, I remember as a teacher and I taught science, how many parents would say, oh, you know, see, I wasn't really a math or science student, so my kid's not really going to be a math or science student. And it turns out most other countries believe that the way you get good at math, you just do math. You practice it. Uh, and so in my own district, uh, I am relatively anonymous, just recently kind of letting my presence be known. Um, but when I went to my daughter's third grade open house last year, I just can't even tell you how often the teacher said, so third grade, math, it is tricky. Really tricky. Don't worry about it but it is tricky. And can you imagine, like, no wonder our kids kind of like go through elementary school saying, yeah, math, that's hard. That's not for all of us, that's just for the wizards. Like, we don't all, we're not supposed to understand this stuff. But the way our curriculum is laid out, it makes it quite obvious. I was sharing before the presentation that last year when my daughter was in third grade, I took a month and I scanned her homework every night for a month and created a PowerPoint slideshow about it, and it was, almost funny again if it wasn't true, how quickly we went from counting cupcakes to telling time to counting money to okay maybe there was a little multiplication. I mean it was just crazy how we uh, have approached math education. So thinking about the three shifts in math, the first one is focus. <coughs> and this is probably the first time in a really long time, if not ever, that we start an education initiative with the conversation that starts with, here's what we need to stop doing. Everything we've ever done in education is as if we weren't already working at 110%, and here's one more thing to do. The Common Core by design starts by saying, we need to figure out how we are going to make time and space in our curriculum to really support all students meeting these higher expectations. And so one of the things that we get with Common Core State Standards is this idea of we focus on fewer things, but in depth, absolutely in depth. Um, and so here is what math typically looked like. I am telling you in every state in this country, I can put this slide up there. And so kindergarten through 12th grade, we do a little bit of numbers and operations, a little bit of patterns and algebra, geometry and measurement, statistics and probability, every single year. Every single year we do this. Even though we know, if I ask any K2 educator, of these four things, what is the thing that you really think you need to focus on? And it is always, always true. Doesn't matter how contentious the audience might be, they always say it's numbers and operations. But it's not what our curriculum shows. It is in there, just like you know that whole Wendy's commercial, it's in there, but it is not the major concept of what students are focusing on. So what we wanna see is greater depth on those major topics that matter. And so what this looks like in the standards, and this might be a bit hard to see, is that in K2, we're focusing on fewer things. Kids are really going to understand the concepts of number because we're not racing through. You know, we had an interesting dinner conversation where I was talking to, to one of your residents here who works in early childhood mathematics, and just having kids understand the concept of the very simple numbers, we just kind of gloss over that. And we right away skip to bigger numbers, not understanding how kids developmentally get good at that. I'll give you a great example. Um, one of the things that we took out of early elementary math standards is the study of patterns. So you probably have all experienced this either as a student or as a parent, where kids come home and it's blue circle, red square, blue circle, red square, blank and we do this. Uh, and so it turns out kids are really good at this, as my, my mom, who's a third grade teacher, tells me, but kids like it. They're good at it. And we took it out of the standards, uh, because it's not math. Um, it's actually a strategy. And in our, my own state of New Jersey, and I was at the department at the time when we were contemplating the standards, uh, the math professors in the state went crazy over this. You cannot take patterns out of the standards. Kids need that to get ready for algebra. It's like finding the missing variable. And so I called the math authors up who I had already met at the time. I said, oh, what do I tell this math professor who's telling me you need this? Just tell them to look at the evidence. Patterns happens to be the only topic that US is number one in the world in. We are not number one in the world in algebra. 
We are really good at it. Kids like it. It puts a smile on their face, but it does not help them with what we need them to be able to do. So one of the uh, things that happens once you get to focus, so if you can imagine what's happening with this idea of focus is that we are actually taking a look at our curriculum and figuring out which things just go away. They go on to middle school instead of elementary school. They go on to later times when kids can actually develop them. Another great example, just sharing parent to parent. My daughter in second grade brought home a worksheet just last week where they're learning how to read temperature on a thermometer. And one of the temperatures that they had to read was 20 degrees below zero. A second grader has no concept of what below zero means, right? I mean, nobody thinks about that. It's just what the worksheet says, so they can do that. But the idea of building math to make sense is very different. And so this idea of when we learn math, we actually make these connections is really important. So last year when my older daughter was in third grade, I decided to give her the greatest gift a mother could give a child, uh, which was to require that she know her multiplication facts. Whatever the teacher was gonna do or not do, I knew, having been a teacher, having been a principal, when you're that kid that knows your multiplication facts, you have an advantage in your science classes, in the rest of your math classes. It is the gift that keeps on giving. So we decided that we were gonna spend some time and energy focusing on that. And it turns out, by the way, that as long as you just make that decision, do the flashcards, it's not such a hard thing to do. You just need to set a value for doing that and then go ahead and do that. And so we did multiplication, she made it through, she got the things you know, necessary to do it. And then I remember being at the bus stop with her Monday morning and she goes, mom, guess what? Today we're doing division. And I will tell you, I just kept saying, oh, when she gets off the bus today, she is gonna be so glad she knows those multiplication facts because all those other kids that didn't know them they would be struggling through division. But if you know multiplication, you know division. I mean, it's the same thing, right? So she comes home and I said, so how did it go with division? She goes, so we had this problem, Mom. And it was 45 divided by 5. And so what the teacher had us do is take 45, subtract 5, subtract 5, subtract 5, subtract 5. And they teach it, and places do this all the time, as repeated subtraction. She goes, takes up a lot of paper, Mom. But the teacher could not teach it as the inverse operation of multiplication because she did, couldn't be assured that every kid in that class knew their multiplication facts. So we teach it as it's a new topic, something absolutely distinct from what they've learned before. So what the standards allow us to do or actually expect us to do is to actually make those connections from year to year and from topic to topic within a grade. And so this is kind of an example of, of previously taught, and I don't know how well you can see this green stuff here. This is the progression of fractions. So one of the features of the standards that, you know, the nerd in me wants to say is just so beautiful, is that we build from grade to grade to grade. So this is fractions, which by the way, is the thing that predicts students' success in algebra and therefore future math beyond that is how well they can understand and manipulate fractions. So previous state standards would have just said something like, you know, by the end of sixth grade, students can perform operations with fractions. Very different from the way these standards are laid out, where in fourth grade, you start off by multiplying a fraction with a whole number. That's the in-depth thing that all kids need to know really well, all kids need to know really well. So then by fifth grade, the expectation changes to multiplying a fraction or a whole number by a fraction. It advances again in sixth grade where you're multiplying uh, and dividing fractions by fractions versus what we used to do is just kind of put all that stuff in one expectation at the end of the grade and didn't really consider how these things develop over time. Another um, third part, last of the three shifts in math, is really going to probably be what looks most significantly different in the math that your children are bringing home to you. There has been this interesting false choice that we typically have in curriculum programs between, so what do you think is more important? That kids understand math or should they be able to get the answer right? And it, it has been kind of this thing that in some states have actually caused significant, you know, what we typically call the math wars. Like, is it about conceptual understanding? 
Is it about procedural skill in mathematics? And within the Common Core State Standards, all three things are important and all three things deserve the time and attention in classroom situations. So here is an example uh, of what we typically do in teaching a very important concept in early elementary, place value. And so you can find worksheets upon worksheets upon worksheets where kids fill out answers like this. I am absolutely certain that you all have experienced this kind of problem in your kids' math, where it's numbers and numbers and numbers, where it's blank hundreds, blank tens, blank ones. And kids figure this out pretty soon. First number goes in the first spot, second number goes in the second spot, and they know nothing about place value. It becomes what? A pattern problem. And so we do these, teachers feel good about it, kids are getting 100% about it, but they're not really understanding the concept. Very different than the type of math problem that asks students to actually show their concepts. Something like this, 14 tens. Is 10 tens and how many more tens? More rich examples that actually go after conceptual understanding. Another example that I typically like to use, uh, more third grade math. Write a number between a fifth and a fourth. Give me a fraction between a fifth and a fourth. Ask students that question, and you get a sense that they really understand the concept of fractions. And just to say, because it's good cocktail humor, 37% of adults surveyed said there is no such number. <laughs> right? Because they know how to like find common denominators, add things up, but do they really understand the concept of a fraction? Ask them what a number is between a fifth and a fourth, and you know whether they know that or not. So this is what's different. Now, as far as you and your children at home and how you can help them in literacy, we can start off with that. Of course, we always want to kind of continue to promote the joy of reading. I'm sure this school system, like everyone across the country, is asking students and parents to read together every evening. All of that is awesome and great, and they should be reading, and you should be reading. That doesn't change. That continues. But also take it to the step of having conversations about what it is that they've read. What do they think about the characters? What do they think is going to happen next? But don't stop there. You need to ask them that second question, which is not what do you think is going to happen next, but how do you know? <laughs> what do you think about this character? What makes you think that? So asking them to go back and give evidence, even if you're reading to a kindergarten student, you can have those kinds of conversations with your children. Encourage them to read about nonfiction things, things that interest them. What can they learn about dinosaurs, the presidents, whatever the topic might be. Um, an interesting thing, boys tend to be much more engaged in nonfiction than girls. And so interesting that they'll have the opportunity to do that more in school, but that girls are going to want and need to kind of seek out nonfiction that might not be as obvious to them. Looking into topics, as we said, following instructions based on reading, all really important. And in math, please let's not tell kids math is tricky. Please not tell, let's not make excuses that math is just hard, but having confidence, making games out of math, practicing things in math, really supporting students in explaining their mathematical understanding is hugely, hugely important. There are all kinds of games out there, ways to get kids to not give up when the math gets tough, but actually using problem solving skills, all really important. So that is four minutes over, but pretty close to record, Jim. Audience, so please write questions on the paper that's provided in your folder. You go ahead and uh, <coughs> write it out and hold it up. And one of my colleagues from Advanced Illinois will come and uh, bring them up, and I'll ask Sandra those questions. Uh, while you're warming up, I will ask the first one. Um, so Sandra, um, one thing that I've heard parents say is that things are fine. Um, why, do we need the, you know, why do we need to change things? Uh, so interesting that when things really are fine, we don't need to change things. And so what we are just kind of refining is our definition of what fine means. And so typically what fine means in a lot of places is that most of our students do okay in things that aren't necessarily those college and career ready skills. And so what the standards are asking us to think about differently for our students, first of all, is how we address the needs of all students, but even in students that are typically achieving, if you think about that mile wide inch deep curriculum, it exists pretty much everywhere in our curriculum, all content areas, and when kids 
turn out to be proficient or they know the math they're supposed to know or they know the reading skills that they need to know, we take that mile wide inch deep curriculum and we just put it at a steeper slope and we give kids more stuff but still at an inch deep. And so what I would encourage you all to think about, particularly if your kids are doing all right now in the system, is are they thinking deeply about this work? Can they do more than just the teacher shows them this and they're really great at repeating that? I've talked to so many adults now who say, boy, they were so good through middle school, high school, college at answering questions like, did you ever fight against something that you felt was unfair? But given the other kind of question, struggled tremendously. So the idea here behind changing these expectations are not only our field of competition is changing, we need to do better for all of our kids, but the idea of how can we really build a system that gives us the opportunity to go deeper, even for kids who are already achieving at the relatively low bar that we set for them now. How will the Common Core impact testing down the road? So it's interesting, the, um, it is a huge issue. So I often think about the people who literally toiled over these standards. And just to say in the world of education, this is like warp speed. Usually if we have an idea, it takes us 10, 15 years or so to actually come to the idea that this is going to happen. These are things that happened over a span of about two years. And one of the things that I thought about is like once these standards were so widely adopted, the people who really worked on this, boy, send them to Fiji, send them on a vacation because that was really hard work. But they knew from day one that if these assessments that came down the pike were not as beautiful, as high of expectations, but ended up to look a lot like the assessments that many of our kids have to do now, who cares that we had great standards? So from the beginning, one of the things that the um, race to the top incentivized is this idea that states should collaborate to create a new set of assessments. And now that we know everything we know from the testing that we've been doing for over a decade now, what would it look like if we were kind of kind of have a restart? And so the thing that I want you to imagine is that the assessments that are coming down and they will be kind of on our students, actually computers, because they will only be delivered online, in the year 2014-15, are assessments that are worthy of instructional imitation. So that if every student, every parent, every teacher saw the questions that were on these tests and in fact taught those things, all these shifts. You're going to read fiction, you're going to read nonfiction. When answering a question, you're going to be asked to give evidence. When answering a math problem, we're not going to ask you questions that don't require that you, in fact, have an understanding of the math topic, for example. So these are assessments that are intended not to be a liability that you teach to the test, but that is the kind of teaching that we want. This is the work going on now. It would be a huge lift for Illinois or any other state to do this independently of each other, but the fact that in the assessment system that Illinois is involved in, the, the park assessment system, 23 states are together designing this new assessment system. As I said, it will be delivered online, intended to inform instruction, intended to give you very rich information about how your students are progressing year to year, so you don't wait till high school to find out if your kids are on track or not for college and career readiness, but you get that information is really what, what is changing um, tremendous amounts of information on that out there. So thank you, Sandra. One thing I love about our community is that we can, within a minute or two, get know, together really uh, 30 questions. <laughs> um, so I love Oak Park. So the first one is, and we'll probably get to about uh, maybe three to five of these. Can you tell us a little bit about um, how we will evaluate the success of the Common Core? Great. So that's an interesting question. There has been some kind of clamor about, didn't we pilot this first? And you can't really pilot standards. It's doesn't really quite make sense to pilot a set of expectations. So we really have definitive goals about what should change once we get into implementation. I mean, these changes are significant. So it's not the fact that give us two years and we'll give you really deep student results, but we're going to see differences, you know, incremental over time. But the things that we should start seeing is a better connection between high school and college. So the significant number of our students, for example, that graduate high school, earn a diploma, and then end up in a remedial course and can't earn a credit, means there's a significant disconnect. 
So first we want to see less remediation happening, but then we also eventually want to see the needle on how all students are doing. If we take a look at some other assessments we give, like the ACT or the National Assessment of Education Progress, given some time, we really do think that those are going to, to change. But it's not a switch. It's not like all of a sudden we're saying, okay, let's do that. It takes some work and some development. Got it. Um, how does or should the Common Core impact the role of libraries? Great question. Great question. Uh, and so libraries are huge. The idea that students are going to need access to all kinds of topics, nonfiction texts, texts of interest, series of texts, uh, I think is great. The idea of text being a source of information, not that I ever was a librarian, but if I was one, I think that's what would really excite me is kind of to open up the world through text for kids um, and to, to realize where kids targeted texts should be in this world of uh, accessing a staircase of complexity and how you get kids really to enjoy reading. It has kind of been often um, by some critics out there thinking, boy, if you say things to kids like read like a detective, write like a reporter, you're taking the love of reading away from them. And it has absolutely been our experience quite the opposite, quite the opposite. What is the plan for music and art within the Common Core? Music and art within the Common Core. It's interesting. I really don't like <laughs> the idea that all of a sudden we're all doing Common Core all the time. And instead of painting, we're reading about painting. Or instead of playing music, we're reading about playing music. And so I will be the first person to come up here and say to you that there are still concepts, experiences that kids need in the arts in particular. I had a, a teacher ask me a couple of weeks ago, so what does Common Core look like in a phys ed class? I'm like, oh. Please, you know, should they be reading the rules over and over again to these games? Like, we really need to figure out what our goals are here. And so this idea of kids reading for information is a critical one. So in your arts curriculum, if kids are already learning about art history or uh, the biographies of artists, for example, rather than the teacher lecturing to you about those, let the kids read that. That's perfectly a great incorporation of Common Core across the curriculum. But let us be reminded not to lose the beauty of those programs and let the music still live and let the art still live for, for its sake. So uh, Oak Park is a leader in early childhood. How would you respond to the criticism from early childhood education experts who see Common Core as out of sync with the best practice beliefs and research for early childhood? It, yeah, research has kind of taken on this really interesting you know, tagline. It has always, but certainly now there's research here and research there, and it's kind of the word everybody throws out. So I can just tell you from my experiences in working in an early elementary uh, school setting and looking at the standards that preceded the Common Core, which were literally laundry lists of things that kids needed to do grade by grade. And so if we think about this concept of focusing on fewer things, going deep on fewer things. And what we know about best practices in early childhood, about kids having real hands-on experiences, experiential learning, you know, it would not be okay in previous pacing charts, for example, to spend a week exploring the number eight. In the Common Core, you really need to do that. The idea of the role of texts when we focus on fewer things, what read alouds look like, one of the things that I read, and I, I read all the good, bad, and ugly press around the Common Core, is that early childhood people who fear the Common Core think of it as kind of this drill and, oh my gosh, our kids are going to have to be doing worksheets every day, and that's not what we think about kindergarten. Nowhere in the Common Core does it say that. Nowhere are we ask, asking that to happen. What we're saying is that we are going to signal for teachers, for parents, here are the things that kids really need to think about. There are about a handful of things. And boy, I can just imagine all of the typical early childhood experiences that would reinforce that. So I do believe it's a bit of misinformation and misuse of the standards when people kind of express some of these worries that they have. I think this is very much in sync. And we just need to make sure that we're all talking about the same thing when we talk about what potential impact this Common Core can have. Great, and so this is my last question from the audience, and perhaps Lisa Swartz, who's up next, can uh, address this a bit. Um, how are teachers going to be trained to implement the standards? It seems difficult uh, to find the time and resources necessary. It, it is true, it, and uh, I always remind myself that I'm going to less and less use the word train when we talk about getting ready for the Common Core. It's not, you know, 
a new app that we're working on. It's not a new program. It's not a new software. This is about learning and teaching and focusing on how to best meet the needs of our kids. There is no you know, one hour workshop, two day workshop I can give any teacher that trains them in the Common Core. This is about understanding what the expectations are and learning really deeply how to meet those needs. And so the good news is we have 45 states working on this right now. There are all kinds of fabulous free resources out there, but the issue of time is a real one. And so uh, one of the bits of advice that I often give people is now is the time to buy time and not books. Textbooks, resources aren't yet caught up to speed with what the Common Core expects. So instead of investing in those things, board member, I would invest in how we help teachers understand. Because when you understand that this is a standards-based system, we need to get really sharp at what these goals and expectations are for our kids and go from there. Uh, and so I commend you all for, for your obvious support of this work. Uh, I think you will um, be interested and intrigued at how many people across the country are focusing on this, uh, that it is hard work. Uh, but as the video that, that introduced this session said, it's something we need to do as a community. And so I have great hopes both uh, for Oak Park and the state of Illinois in getting this work done. Thank you, Sandra. Um, so I'm actually gonna take off from where Sandra just left. Uh, talking about teachers and professional development, because that has been our big focus this year, is to provide our teachers with an opportunity to learn about the Common Core firsthand. And that's been done in several ways, both in large group settings, we've had some settings like this where all teachers come together, hear similar messages, and also in a more intense way where we've provided a lot of professional develop to development to a small group of teachers who are working closely with the teachers both at their schools and within our schools across the district. Um, one of the things that you've heard is we're looking for some things to be much more common um, so that our teachers are working together to ensure that we're developing um, our common core plans across the district um, with all the schools and all the grade levels. Um, we really focused this year on the English language arts standards. <coughs> it's not to say that we haven't looked at the other standards, but that's been our real focus, to give teachers time to really look and get comfortable with those. And what we've done, the teachers have created um, these monthly calendars. And what the calendars do is identify um, specific standards that we are going to be um, assessing across a month. And those are, again, common both across a grade level, but across the district. And we're doing this multiple times across the school year. So we've just begun the spring, kind of with full implementation for teachers to actually kind of step back from some of the materials that we've been using, really look at the standards, and look at how we're assessing them. Um, and these assessments look different. And Sandra mentioned it a little bit, that um, it's probably not gonna be a multiple choice test that's coming home all the time but we're asking our students to do some authentic performance tasks. So this might be writing, it might be speaking, and we're gonna collect evidence of how the students do looking at the standards over time. So that when you sit down at a parent-teacher conference, most likely the teacher's gonna be talking about the standards, and they're gonna be talking about the reading, there's informational standards, there's literature standards, and say, this is how your child's doing. We started off here in the fall, and this is where we are in the spring, and I'm gonna show you some evidence of some of the work that the student has done. And so we're having these conversations with our elementary teachers, with our middle school teachers, and we're including all of the content area teachers in these uh, discussions. Because one of the things that we constantly hear is all teachers are teachers of reading and writing. Um, and we talked a little bit about like art and PE, so they may not be assessing students' writing, but they may have them occasionally write something that may be used in one of the other classes. Uh, so the other thing that will start to be changing is the increase in the use of nonfiction. Um, so we're in the process of identifying those resources. Um, some of them are materials that we have in our buildings. We're looking at some of the materials that are available online. Um, so you'll see some of the things that your children are doing are different. Some of our um, elementary teachers, some of the primary teachers are also looking at how we can better integrate our science and social studies so that when they're actually working in reading time, they're gonna be reading about something that they're studying in science or social studies. 
So we're just starting our work with math, and um, that's going to be, again, some changes. Um, some of you are familiar with our math curriculum, which is what they call a spiraling curriculum, which means you're introduced to a concept, and the students don't learn it, they don't master it, but you're told we're coming back to it. So that's going to start to change. And again, these are going to be slow shifts for us, um, but you're going to see some things that look a little bit different, and some of the things are going to come off the curriculum that maybe you've had a first grade before, and you know the things they typically do in first grade, but they're going to be things that are no longer taught in first grade, some things that just aren't taught in math at all. So those are some of the changes that we're working on. Um, but as a parent, um, the best thing that you can do is stay in communication with your teacher. When you have questions, I know a lot of teachers are starting to communicate sometimes via their blogs um, or via newsletters that come home, things that they're working on. When you see your students bring home some of their work, ask them about it. How did you do this? What did you do before this? Part of the process that we're talking about for a lot of the standards is some scaffolding so that teachers will actually be modeling it and doing it before the students actually do it on their own. Um, and lastly, we have some uh, information available for parents on our website. If you go to the Teaching and Learning homepage, under Common Core, we have some parent guides listed that were put out by the National PTA and the Council of Great City Schools. So if you click on any grade level, there's one for K up through eight, um, you'll download and you'll get a complete file. And in this file has just some questions that you can talk to your teachers about and just some overall um, concepts that, and skills that your students will be learning in each of the grade levels. Okay? All right. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. So thank you, Lisa. Several Illinois organizations, including our state's teachers unions, the PTA, groups of district administrators, and others have banded together to create a resource for parents about the Common Core and what we can do to navigate these changes, sorry, to navigate the changes that the new standards will bring. Um, the Common Core Illinois website provides information geared towards parents, educators, offering lots of downloads, videos, and tips that you can use to help your students make the transition to the higher standards. You'll see video of Oaks Park's very own Carolina Song talking about standards <laughs> and the importance to them and her family. Um, so this is what, what it looks like. I'll also be following up uh, with all the RSVPs, everybody who's here, um, with the website that Lisa mentioned. That is the Oak Park District 97 um, homepage that has uh, the PTA uh, grade level uh, information. Um, there's also a card with website information in your folders, looks like this. As well as ways to help your child, looks like this. Just encourage you to check out those two handouts um, so that you can start helping your child right now, helping them adapt to the new standards. If you go to that website, you can also sign up for bi our bi-monthly um, newsletter that will keep you up to date on what is happening with the new standards and assessments in Illinois. And remember, it's more important than ever to work with your child and, and their teachers to support our kids and help them succeed. I'd like to thank Dr. Roberts for agreeing to host this event in District 97. And I'd like to thank John Hodge and his team at Irving um, also for hosting us. As I mentioned, I'll be sending you all the links um, to not only some of the resources that have been mentioned here, but also video clips so that you're welcome to share with others who are unable to attend. Mm -hmm. I'd like to also thank our parent volunteers from the PTO Council and my college from Advanced Illinois for passing out materials and getting everybody seated. And lastly, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors, Oak Park Elementary School, District 97, <coughs> District 97's PTO Council, the Oak Park Teachers Association, and Common Core, Illinois. Thank you very much for coming out on such a beautiful night. Please stick around or email me if you have questions. Thanks again.